Greetings everyone. Welcome to this recording of our second Spring Session Series online meeting with Dr. Michael Goody. Michael has an educational background in biology, medicine, clinical psychology and psychosocial animation. He's worked as a lecturer and a counsellor for scholarship students at AUB, a trainer in the mental health with in mental health with the Ministry of Public Health and various local, regional and international NGOs. Is an advisor on several international NGOs, a trainer on communication skills, a mental health specialist in palliative care and dignity therapy, and a clinical psychologist in private practice since 2006. Uh, it was my pleasure to uh, welcome him and uh, please enjoy the following uh, recording of his presentation about depression in teenagers. Some very, very interesting material and very uh, useful for parents of teenagers. I'll hand it over to Michael. So the core of depression in two words is hopelessness and helplessness. I'm hopeless. I don't think things are going to change. And I'm helpless. I believe that nothing and no one can help me. I can't help myself and no one can help me. This is the crux of depression. Uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy or the cognitive model and therapy, there are different schools out there, but one of the big ones is the behavioral school or the cognitive behavioral school, which has I, which have identified three distorted thinking in, in, in depression, people who have depression, which is the low sense of self-worth, like I am worthless, I am no good. Seeing people that they are not so good or not so helpful, so others cannot help, nobody can do anything about it. And catastrophizing the future. It will always be like this. This is what we call the cognitive triad or the, the depressive cognitive triad. And it is found in most people, young or old, um, who have depression or who are going through a depression in their life. So to diagnose depression, I need to have five of the following nine symptoms that would last for at least two weeks for most of the day. So all of us can have these symptoms in our lives. But for, for, for me to be going through a depression, I need to have, first of all, five out of the nine symptoms. Second of all, I need to have one of the two or the two uh, first symptoms, either sadness or loss of interest. These have to be part of the five. Second or third, these symptoms that I'm going through have to be there most of the days in any two-week period. And fourth, they have to cause significant distress right, in my life. And fifth, I need to rule out any drugs or substances that I'm using or any other medical disorders like hypothyroidism. I do all that and I have these five out of, out of the nine, I most likely have a depression clinical depression, what we call a major depressive disorder, MDD. So briefly, the symptoms are sadness. I'm feeling some people, you know, experience it as a heaviness, a chest heaviness, um, or like I am uh, not myself. I'm more, more gloomy right, than usual. Um, and then the loss of interest, which basically means that I'm not enjoying things that I used to enjoy before. Remember, um, all the symptoms of depression have to be a change from the normal, from what I used to be. We're going to see that mostly in sleep. So, for example, if I, if I usually sleep six hours, and we know that the average is seven to nine hours, that's good sleep. Um, you know, if I'm assessing somebody for the symptom, I'm asking them, you know, you're sleeping six hours. Is that your normal or is that a change? And if it's a normal, you know, it, it just continues, then I don't consider it as a symptom. All right. So these are just some details. Um, the third idea is that, you know, uh, people with depression have more uh, negative evaluate themselves uh, much less and so it's my fault I'm bad I'm less I'm a failure 
I didn't do this right. I can't talk to people well. Um, I'm going to fail my exam. Always this uh, lower self-esteem. What we call sometimes rumination. There is this continuous negative self-talk that goes on and on. It could be ruminating about something bad that happened to them in the past, but it like never leaves their mind. Right? So always there, which is linked with poorer outcomes uh, when somebody has a lot of rumination. And then depression can affect my concentration, either my job or in my academia, or sometimes even watching TV becomes too much, or reading the newspaper or browsing the internet. Also involves changes in their also, not just mental, it's not just cognitive, it's not just thoughts, but it's also bodily. Um, and this could be increase in sleep, sleeping more, or decrease in sleep, insomnia, different types of insomnia. The appetite could also be hyper or hypo. Again, compared to the norm, pre-depression. Another common symptom is low energy. I, I just don't have the energy to do things anymore, which is different than enjoying things or not. The eighth symptom is a bit tricky, but basically... Uh, it's, it's said by the family members mostly or by the cl cl clinician uh, that you observe that the person is either moving slower than they used to move or faster or talking slower or talking faster. Usually we see the slower. It's as if everything is in slow motion. And finally, and most importantly, to, to rule out or to explore or to make sure it's not there, and if it's there, we need to do something about it because this is the medical emergency in psychiatry, which is the suicidal thoughts or plans or attempts. And this is graded. Uh, it has certain criteria, and each uh, grade needs different intervention. We're going to talk a bit about suicide in our uh, presentation today because it is super important not to miss it and to do something about it. Um, Almost 84% of people, almost 90% of people who, who do attempt suicide have a depression. So you can almost say everyone, almost everyone who attempts suicide has to be worked out for depression and treated accordingly. When we know that when we successfully treat the depression, the suicidality is most likely going to go away. Um, just to... Just to make sure, you know, when we are talking about depression, there are other things that could be correlated or, or comorbid with depression and important things we need to rule out before we diagnose depression or before we uh, only diagnose depression because sometimes depression can come with other illnesses. Most commonly is anxiety. Anxiety and depression are like very two close cousins. They, they, they come together a lot. And um, it, it affects the treatment, not what the therapist or the psychiatrist will do, and maybe what the parents also can do. But basically, we need to rule out mania. It's an important one, which is the opposite of a depression. Depression is a low state. Mania is a hyper state or a very happy, very on top of the world, very um, I can do anything, very I'm the bravest kid on the block and the smartest kid on the block with uh, high energy in spite of no sleep. So it's like a, a abnormally high high that lasts for many days. And it's important to be careful about this because it affects treatment also. Uh, ODD stands for Oppositional Defined Disorder and CD stands for Conduct Disorder which are common also co-occurrences with depression, especially in youth. So if you go to a clinician, uh, you want to make sure that he or she rules those out, which is basically a kid who is very defiant, who um, you know, uh, opposes authority a lot and might have some um, harmful behavior to society and to oneself and to others. So this is basically... Uh, you know, the main ideas that I want to share with you when we are thinking of depression, understanding depression as a state of helplessness and hopelessness. Please, 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 we want on one hand not to rush into fear that 
our kids go through these, it means that they have depression. We want to try and avoid the over vigilant. We also want to try and avoid under vigilant. So it's a it's a balanced line here, and I wish I wish I had a very you know one two three four steps to follow. But I'm gonna say that we all go through these symptoms. We sometimes don't concentrate well enough. Sometimes our sleep gets disrupted. Sometimes we are sad, which is a healthy emotion, by the way, people. Emotions of anger, sadness, irritability, uh, as long as they are uh, in relation to the situation, um, what is expected in a certain situation are healthy emotions. Even fear is a healthy emotion. When it gets too much beyond the situation, what is expected from the situation, and when it disrupts other aspects of our lives, then we need to start worrying a bit more or tackling it a bit more in that sense. So if your kid has some of these symptoms once in a while, they last less than two weeks, if they don't have the sadness, the heaviness, or the lack of interest, they probably don't have depression, most likely, all right? And we just want to be more supportive, try and understand what's happening. It's probably a psychosocial issue or just some, maybe some hormones, maybe some a phase of adolescence, maybe an issue with a teacher or a grade that they got. This is not depression, all right? So before moving to the other slide, this is our first pit stop. I'm just going to wait maybe for 30 seconds. In case any of you have a question, please. Um, the first one is always uh, maybe the bravest person to break the ice in this monologue. If you have any questions about understanding depression, you may go ahead and ask. And I will do some breathing. Uh, Michael, yeah. uh, it's, I just have a question. Um, yeah. uh, are you going to talk more about suicide later? Because we always, yeah. as counselors, get questions related to that. Yeah. Are you going to talk more detail? Yeah, it's, I think on my uh, fourth slide, we're going to talk a bit about suicide. And please feel free then to ask questions or maybe share some experiences together. And, we can do that in a bit. Okay, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Okay. I'm going to move on. So I have two slides on why depression. This is basically some stats um, to appreciate the, the number um, in depression. So... We say that, first of all, we say that anxiety is the common cold of mental illness uh, because it's quite common. Up to 50, 60% of people will get some kind of anxiety issue or disorder throughout their lifetime. So we compare it to the common cold. And depression is not far behind. It's just a few percentage below um, anxiety. And I like to call it um, the common allergy. And the metaphor of the allergy is not haphazard. One, because it's common. But two, is because we know, we know that we don't have a causal explanation for allergy. We have many explanations for allergy, but we don't have a cause. But we have what we call triggers, allergen, things that we know are going to uh, increase the chance of uh, making your allergy worse. So we talk about pollen, we talk about cats, we talk about dust. And one way to look at the and then preventing them and treating them with medications, anti-allergies, you know, uh, histamine, um, some nasal sprays can go a long way in managing the symptoms. And so this is our current understanding of depression from all the science and the research that has been done, that it is not the person's fault. There is no one cause, multifactorial. We don't know for sure. We know what, what is fertile grounds for depression, what increases the chances of depression. We're going to talk about those in the biopsychosocial model. There are some biological factors, psychological factors, sociological factors. And we know that it's treatable. There are so many ways to treat it. So... The other thing about depression is, you know, almost one, one in four women worldwide, the research is pretty clear and solid on that one, will we'll get depression in their lifetime. 
We also know that women more than men, two to one, get depressed. And that's what we call the double standard of depression. So it's, it's a good way or maybe not so good way to, to memorize this ratio. The WHO, you know, has put a certain number in the, in the million of people with depression worldwide. I think this is a 2020 stats. Uh, that almost 264 million people have a depression worldwide, which is around 5% of the population. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a pretty high number. And most of it is due to depression. So you can say six out of the 11 uh, mental health problems is depression. So it takes a big chunk in the pie chart of mental health challenges. Uh, for you specifically, uh, you know, a 2 to 8% of them uh, will experience uh, depression uh, every year. If we take every year, if you look at the IC students who range from 4 to 18 years, you can say roughly 6% of them are going to experience depression. So if you have 1,000 students, you're going to have 60 students every year who are going to go through a depression. And that's why it's important to look out for it, to diagnose it, and to treat it. Uh, so these are kind of the numbers. Now, the other numbers are uh, the risks for suicide. You know, because depression is highly linked to suicide, uh, we need to watch out for it. But 800,000 people die to suicide each year. It's almost a million people. And those are the ones that we know of. So million is not an underestimation. Think about it in the world. One million people every year. And we know from our NGOs here in Lebanon and Embrace that uh, the number of suicides has been increasing. Now, is this because we are catching it more or because it's a real increase? We're not sure. But we know that suicide is uh, prevalent in our country, Lebanon, and we need to do something about it. And unfortunately, we have not been very successful as a community, as a worldwide community, to decrease suicide. We're not doing so well, we have to admit, but there is hope. Uh, amongst the age group of 15 to 29 years old worldwide, suicide is the second leading cause of death. I think the drug, drug abuse, if I'm not mistaken, is the first. Suicide is the second. The other reasons why we need to talk about depression, educate about depression, it's because it's a chronic illness. Sorry about that uh, squeaking noise. That's my UPS that's to keep us alive. So it will go in a few seconds. Uh, we know that uh, if a person has one episode, the first episode of depression, there is a 50% chance across the lifetime that they will get the second episode. 50%. If that's not chronic illness, I don't know what it is. If somebody has two episodes, there's a 70% chance that they will get a third. If somebody has three episodes already in their life, chances become more than 90% that they will get another one, a fourth. Because you can see, depression, especially untreated depression, definitely has a chronic path, and now we're sure about it. What we're also sure is that depression does happen to children. We used to think that it didn't happen to children. Why would a child be depressed? Now we know children can be depressed for a var variation of reasons, again, biological, family, relational, psychological. And we know that children who are untreated for depression have a much worse outcome than those who are treated. So we need to treat it. I wish I have changed as a therapist. I've been a therapist for 20 years. And I have to be, and I would like to be honest with you, during the first seven years of my journey, I was anti-psychiatry, anti-medication, all about love and compassion and empathy that this will solve the world's problems. And the more I learned and the more I went into this field, the more I realized that this is not enough. We have to face the reality that the mind, the brain can get sick. 
like any organ in our bodies. We have to face that reality earlier, better, and more courageously. So this has been my experience. This, has, this is the science. This is um, you know, my interpretation of the very solid evidence that I'm sharing with you today. We know that depression is debilitating. It's not just a chronic illness, but it's an illness that affects the way I think, the way I relate, the way I feel, the way I perform. And this definitely can put me in a vicious cycle. So the more failures I have because of my depression, the more depression, the more I'm, the, the intense the depression symptoms I'm going to have. And then the higher the chances I'm going to feel like a failure or actually fail. Um, and then it's a vicious cycle that's very difficult to snap out of. So this gonna, we're going to see this in the advice. We cannot tell people, snap out of it. This is not something to snap out of. We also know, of course, depression is preventable. There are many psychosocial interventions, preventive, preventive programs. The counseling in schools is super important. I don't know Dana and Rama at the personal level or at the professional level, but I salute them with all my heart, with all my science, that I'm sure they are helping very much in preventing suicide. And of course, not just Don and Rama, but the whole school system, parents included. And we are becoming more aware of this, more vigilant. And we are changing uh, how we intervene and intervening earlier. And the problem is that we don't see things that are good. Right? When something is prevented, we don't see it. And we need to remind ourselves that probably, most likely, we have prevented hundreds of children and adolescents and young people from getting depressed because of what we're doing as parents, as counselors, as school managers, as psychotherapists early on. We have done that. We just don't see it. What we see strongly is a surgeon in an emergency room there's an appendicitis, somebody did a motor vehicle accident, their bones are out of their bodies, they did an operation, thank you, surgeon. Those are the ones that we see. But the ones that we don't see are actually more important because they have a higher number and they have a higher impact. And so we just need to maybe take a few minutes every day of every week to be thankful, to be grateful for all that is done and not very seen or unseen. The challenge is always getting people to access the right services and good services. Unfortunately, worldwide, not just in Lebanon, only 20 to 30% of people who need help get the help they need, unfortunately, and that's very sad. And the number one priority of um, government and health uh, system ought to be increasing access to care. And that's what many countries are doing, including here in Lebanon. I work with the ministry. We're doing a great job relative to where we were and relative to our resources. There are some wonderful people working very hard to improve mental health and specifically access to care by improving uh, primary care, uh, healthcare centers, uh, services, especially mental health services. And we've done a lot of trainings for people. So uh, before I move to this uh, table, any questions on the why of depression, either the importance of depression, the numbers that we talked about, it's linked to uh, highly correlation to suicide, and that it is a chronic debilitating illness that the earlier we intervene, the much better the outcome. Uh, Michael, there are a few questions. Uh... On, on the list and the chat. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe Rama, uh, yeah. I mean, one of them is what's the youngest age at which yeah. depression can begin? So, uh, according to my readings and my memory, it could be as it could be in childhood. So, four or five years old can get a clinical depression. And the biggest example of this is when when uh, children that were studied that were institutionalized who lost their parents or who were, you know, put in an institution early on. Um, there are many studies on that. And if you look at the facial expressions of children, it is scary because it's like an adult who has had all the problems of the world on their shoulders and got a depression. 
uh, and you see that on the face of a four or five years old. Um, I can send you, um, if you want, send me an email. I can send you a photo of that, or you can Google it. Mm -hmm. So sure. four to five years old can get depressed. It's not very common. We see it. Uh, you can ask a child psychiatrist who has, I'm not a child uh, psychologist, so I don't see a lot of children. Uh, I see them in a family setting because I'm a family therapist. Uh, too. So, uh, but we see it usually uh, pubertal adolescence that age. That's the most common one, but it does exist in children for sure. Uh, Dr. Michael, hi. Hi. Uh, I have just a question. Is it normal for children to think about uh, suicide? Mm -hmm. And if yes, it is a matter of attention or uh, a matter of uh, depression? Yeah. That's an excellent question. So the first answer is yes, it is normal. It is normal and common for children to be curious about death, like they are curious about anything, from academia to plants to animals to iPads to YouTube to sexual organs and to death. And it, in many, many times, it could be a good sign, a sign of intelligence, a sign of imagination, a sign of empathy, a sign of attunement. Now, how to make sure that it is in that play, playing field and not in the other playing field is by checking for other symptoms. So if it's linked with sadness, change in mood, irritability, change in appetite, social isolation, uh, uh, sorry about that too. That's a new one. Uh, it hasn't happened in a while. Um, um, uh, you know, bedwetting, any uh, more significant sign, then yes, I would want to ask my child more questions. We're going to talk about the things that you can do. Maybe ask my partner or other people if they're noticing something. So it's not just me. Check with the counselors at school, etc. I need to do more. But most of the time, it is uh, a normal thing. Now, the thing in between a mental health condition and a positive, resilient normalcy is more around what we call psychosocial distress. Psychosocial distress in this case could be the, the number one hits in my head. Media. That's the number one. I've had a lot of cases, both in, my, both in my private life and in my professional practice, where the child's behavior changed. And when we did some exploration, it was a YouTube video or a TikTok video. By the way, I've stopped for my six-year-old child, I've stopped TikTok uh, a year ago. Uh, I thought it was funny at the beginning, and then I realized it's not. So that has been banned. Uh, you know, and, and all the social media awareness that we need to do as parents right now, that's super crucial. Second, watching news with the family, the eight o'clock news, not good because, you know, they don't filter scenes. Uh, a third could be any type of sexual uh, misconduct or sexual molestation that could have happened. Uh, fourth is witnessing. Uh, danger with somebody, like somebody fell, somebody really har harmed themselves in their entourage. So these are just some of the questions I want to uh, rule in or rule out. And accordingly, I would intervene. So intervention would be something like educating about that, illness, cancer, uh, because some children, you know, get exposed to other children with a cancer or on TV or on social media. So you want to educate about this. I, of course, age appropriately, and there are many guidelines out there on how to do so. And then the okay. other common one, sorry, in psychosocial is hanging out with peers or with, yeah, with older peers. So we see it very commonly also, like 80-year-old 80 80 -year hanging out with 12 years old. You know, it's a different uh, mindset. And the 12 years old might start talking about sex. They might start talking about rape in terms of the concept, you know. They might start talking about uh, depression, suicide, drug use. They don't have to be doing it themselves, but they might be reading it and just talking about it. And the eight-year-old or the seven-year-old is listening to this, but they're not ready to listen to it in that way. So here we usually, 
you know, sit with the 12 years old and the 14 years old and tell them, you know, when John is around or when Tammy is around or when Zainab is around, please don't open up those topics or make sure you speak in an age appropriate way and we educate them a bit and now things are better. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Please, if I don't answer your question, ask me, ask me again, okay? Because I can't see your faces. Uh, Michael, there's another question in the chat. If depression is situational, yeah. does it classify as depression and does it need medication? Excellent question. So our experience has been, and when I say our, it means here in Lebanon as a clinician and then worldwide uh, European science and American science and Southern Hemisphere science also because now the science is broadening up and we're basically finding more similarities than differences. So I'm all for cross-cultural and intercultural differences. And we also need to acknowledge the similarities. And in my readings and experience, they are, we are much more similar than different. So having said that, we know that uh, once somebody has these five of these nine symptoms or more for a two-week period, for most of the days, irrespective, of what triggered it. It is a clinical depression because we know that down the line, it's gonna affect their social occupation, it's gonna affect their mood, it's gonna become chronic. It, it fulfills all the symptoms and the uh, behavior of depression. And so yes, the answer is irrespective if it's situational. We need to treat it as a depression. Now, treatment could include some psychosocial changes, some more family support. And if that is helpful, some problem solving, some relaxation, some time out, this could work. Um, uh, and if that doesn't work, we move to the next level, which was more counseling support. And if that doesn't work, we move to therapy, which is the talk therapy. And if that doesn't work, we move to medication. But if somebody comes with a severe depression, which means the symptoms are there severely, they are very frequent, they're intense, they're affecting the life, uh, you know, the livelihood of the person. And so we diagnose the intensity as to moderate to a severe depression. Then the research tells us that the best outcome is combining pharmacotherapy, which is medication, and psychotherapy, which is the talk therapy, together. I love the questions. Wow, amazing. Donna, shall we move on and then keep, keep going with questions after the next pit stop? Uh, okay, Michael, we have a question from right. Mona. Uh, could you please discuss how today's unpre unprecedented events, corona, economic difficulties, and uncertainties might lead to depression for teenagers? Right. So what we know about depression briefly, uh, there is no one-to-one -one or, again, causal link between situations and uh, mental health. There is a correlation. So that's first of all. Not every time we go through or the world goes through difficult things, even if it's crises and pandemic, uh, we're going to have everybody being depressed. The numbers are usually higher. Yes, we do see a general increase. Uh, in mental health challenges or conditions, but it is not that dramatic, okay? So that's the first thing. Because what we also see is resilience, coping, adaptation, and those are higher. So we see more of those than of mental health conditions. Having said that, uh, you know, adolescents and teens in these situations are going through what we call a uh, a role transition. Their lives have changed. And there are four, four major social triggers for depression. One of them is role transition, when things change. Second is death, when somebody loses somebody uh, to death. Third is conflict, when somebody is engaged in a conflict. Fourth is social isolation. These are the four most common social triggers for depression. These are like the uh, allergens in the allergy metaphor. These are the pollen, the dust, the, you know, the food, and the animal, right? Uh, so 
briefly, uh, yes. I mean, the youth have, uh, you know, the, the, their peer system has changed. They're not able, been able to see their, uh, um, uh, they're not able to perform, uh, in, you know, academically. The structure is disrupted. Um, they were, you know, uh, expecting to travel. Now they can't, etc. Uh, so there are, these are big changes that can increase depression. At the same time, coping skills, problem-solving skills, adaptation skills can help curb the tendency towards an increased likelihood of depression. So meeting friends safely, face-to-face, -face, doing this, you know, uh, co cohort of uh, people who only see each other, uh, using social media to engage, uh, you know, uh, doing the sports, the healthy nutrition, the structure, the balance of work uh, can be can go a long way in curbing depression. I hope I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Great. And what about okay? So what about someone who committed not committed? I'm um, uh, attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. Although he was fine before, or he or right. she was fine before, right. and uh, confident, but because of the situation, all of the uncertainties. Yeah. yeah. Then what do you think that? Um, What's the explanation you have for that situation? Right. So the quick one is, again, that most likely they had either like a hidden or a subclinical mental health condition that got activated or perturbed or increased by uh, the social changes. And then uh, the suicidality uh, showed up. That's just the most likely explanation. We rarely see, I've never seen a case you know, from kind of normal <laughs> to full normalcy to suicidality and, and one jump. Uh, there is usually something there, a subclinical or hidden or personality disorder, uh, what we call personality disorder, that might be uh, contributing to suicidality. Or the person also might have had some suicidal attempts, but they didn't show. Uh, so it might be self-harm behavior, drunk driving, uh, you know, risk cutting, uh, overdosing or over binging on alcohol, risky behavior or harmful behavior. And then because uh, now parents are, uh, you know, are, they saw it more. So these are possible explanations. Whatever the explanation is, take that person to treatment. Okay. And we're going to maybe talk about uh, maybe if we have time, the suicide safety plan, how to keep the person safe, because this is a medical emergency. Okay, so what, what would you advise parents to do in that situation? Right. So we're going to talk about this in the end, if it's okay for you to, uh, to wait for that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Okay. So I'm just going to move on, just because I'm aware of time, which always flies by quicker than we would like it to. So I'm going to move to some slides quickly. I'm going to focus more on what the type of questions you've been asking me. But in this uh, table, I just wanted to show you the multifactoriality of depression. And in fact, any mental health condition is multifactorial, even autism or even schizophrenia that have more biological components. But in addition to the biological, there's always a psychosocial component. So with depression uh, on the biological side, the biggest one to rule out is hypothyroidism. So we want to get the person checked for the thyroid, which is the gland here in the neck that is responsible for metabolism. Uh, family history is also important. There's depression or any mental illness in the family that it could have a more genetic contribution, but we are not victims to our genes. Uh, protective factor physically, we know the biggest one is physical health. The, the more physically healthy the person is, the less likely they're about to get depression. And if they have depression, it's less likely to repeat. And by physical health, here we mean people, the, the least is uh, good enough, which is a 30-minute daily walk. That's all you need. 30 minutes daily walk. Not every five days you do a two-hour walk. That doesn't help much. It's better than nothing. Let me correct myself. It's helpful. But the, the one that has been evidence-based strongly 30-minute walk daily. It's okay if you miss a day in the week, that's fine. Try to do a day. Psychologically, we know anxiety is, you know, a fertile ground for depression, poor communication skills, poor assertiveness skills, 
poor anger management skills, uh, uh, lower self-esteem. These are all adverse psychological. The good ones, the protective ones, and the preventive ones are higher self-esteem, better communication skills, managing stress. There are many. You know, I just chose a few. Sociologically, we know the number one sociological killer for all mental health, for our well-being, is social isolation. Number one. If you give me a choice, choose one thing that you want to change in the world, I would choose social isolation, breaking social isolation. It hurts. And we know that more, it's not about the numbers. You don't have to have a ton of friends on Facebook or in real life. You just have to have a few good quality relationships. You're going to be mostly protected from most mental health illnesses. So please, help your teens. Develop the skills to maintain relationships, keep relationships, work out relationships, both in the family and in peers, etc. Uh, I'm not going to go into those, but I'm just going to throw it out there. People who are in the LGBTQ community who, or who are, don't identify as heterosexual have four times the chances of being, having a poorer mental health condition. So. If our sons and daughters identify as queers or gay or bisexual, transsexual, or anything other than the heteronormative uh, society, they need more help. They need more support. So quickly, what do we see in teens other than the nine? Uh, we see mostly irritability. If I was to choose one, it would be the first one. Irritability, edginess, ma'alikhile, you know, screw this. I don't want to do that. Uh, why do I have to eat these eggs? <laughs> Blurting out. Irritability. That's a big one. Now, not every teen who's irritable has depression. Okay? It could be, again, uh, stress. It could be corona. It could be, it doesn't mean depression. But again, if it, uh, there's sadness, there is loss of interest, there's change in sleep, da, 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 then we are, you know, looking, we need to not miss depression. Anger, aggression, you know. Bullying, bullying more others. It's another sign, you know, it's letting the anger out. Uh, increased screen time because it's linked with social isolation. Unexplained aches and pains, usually headaches, stomach aches in young children or young adolescents. Uh, extreme sensitivity to criticism, you know, easily crying or over exaggerating that mom, you know, you, you know, you're calling me a failure or when you say this to me, I feel like a failure and I cry. Rebellious behavior, smoking, substance use, avoiding family, big one. Drop in school performance, running away uh, from, from the house. We don't see this much in Lebanon. I'm seeing it a bit more now. By the way. Um, and, you know, negative body image, self-image. I don't look nice. I don't look good. I don't look cool. I'm you know, too self-conscious. And saying things to you like, I'm stupid. I'm not good. I'm a failure. These are warning signs that I need to ask my teenager more questions so let's jump into suicide just because of time um like the question that was asked whenever somebody talks about suicide even if jokingly i need to ask them more questions what do you mean mom where is this coming from um are you okay so i need to follow up with that not just let it pass I'd better be of that. There's no way out. What's the point of life? You know, these discussions, again, if they're linked with changes, irritability, mood, definitely need to talk more about them and ask my son or daughter for more questions. Uh, romanticizing death is a common one we see with adolescents. You know, if I die, I'll be remembered forever. I'll be on the cover of so-so. I'll be on TV. I'll make a change in the world. You know, my, my suicidality has some meaning. Uh, no, this is not this is not normal in terms of you know behavior. Uh, writing about it in poems or in social media or on Facebook pages is another uh, you know red red alert sign. Giving away prized possessions if you notice your your son or daughter giving away important things, risky behavior, drug overdose, uh, etc. Remember, the most common two factors linked with suicidality are mood disorder, mostly depression and being female, young female. So moving to parents a little bit, you know, when parents come talk about their kids, this is something common. They say he hates himself and he hates everybody around him. 
Let's move to some tips quickly before we close it with some questions. Sorry about the time. It always runs out, but here we go. So the first tip is your own attitude and understanding of depression. Remember, please, guys, depression is an illness. I wish it wasn't. I wish it was just some stress here or maybe being uh, in a certain country. Or It's more than this, okay? We're sure of it. It's more than this. It is our biology, it is our biochemistry, it is our stress, it is our uh, communication. It's all this together. But if I get depression, it's a serious illness. It's not the person's fault. It's not your fault because remember, it's not causal. Even if you, ha you have a tense uh, you know, a marital relationship or if you move countries every two years, this is probably just one factor, but it's not a cause. And it can be remedied. It can be worked through. So remove the fault from your children and remove the fault from yours. Remove guilt, please. Remove blame. Those don't help and they are not true. Go into understanding, into openness. This is an illness like an allergy, like diabetes, like hypertension. And we are here to help each other. That's your attitude. All right? Second is communication. Listen, listen, listen. Don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. So be like, tell me more, honey. What's going on? I will not judge you. you know? Yes, that's understandable. I can see that when you felt this way, you acted like this with your brother. It is hard what happened, but it's okay. It's not your fault. Let's see how we can help you. Teens, you know, they don't like to be, uh, you know, talked down to or, uh, you know, uh, patronized. So tell them, you know, speak to them like a partner. How do you feel? What do you think? What do you think you can do? What have you tried? And then gauge it. If you feel they're not ready to listen more to you right now, that's okay. One idea at a time. They're not able to take three ideas. You can talk with them tomorrow or in the afternoon. That's fine. Uh, consider a third party. If you've tried everything and you feel like you're stuck or they're not changing or something is not working, bring somebody in. It could be a friend. It could be a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It could be your partner. It could be a cousin. It could be an aunt, an uncle. Somebody that you think has a good relationship with your son and daughter. Bring them in. You know, my son and daughter is going through this. We all went through this. Remember your teens? We all went through something like that. So it's okay. And you can say this to your sons and daughters. We all went through similar things. Trust me. Break the social isolation is the third big one. Okay? Try, if your teen is in the room, you know, go to them every now and then. Sit with them. Try and get them out of the room gently, shui shui, one step at a time. If they're too much on the screen, try and discuss with them maybe a certain time guideline where they can maybe have two hours on the screen and, and, you know, and then they need to do something else, maybe timer on their iPad if they're younger, timer on their watches, something that you agree to as a rule and explain to them why. Always give the rationale of why you are doing this, especially for teens. But we know that this works even for children. Tell them why. Behavioral activation is a big one. Sorry, I will not go into the details of it, but what we know helps for sure is structure during the day, good sleep hours. Teens need nine hours, not six, not five, not seven. Nine. So try and talk, discuss this with them, that their brain is changing. They need the energy. They need the sleep. And find out ways you can increase their amount of sleep. I know it sounds like an impossible task, but we, we want to try. Increase pleasurable activities. Some people, if you, look, if, you, if, you tell, if you look at your teen's life, from morning to evening, they're either studying, working, helping, cleaning, cooking, whatever they do. There's, sometimes they're not, there's not enough pleasurable activities. And then you need to inc include that. 30-minute um, walk we talked about. Engaging in community. The, the research is super high on that one. The more we help and give others, the better we feel. Don't ask, don't ask me too much why it happened. No, we're sure it happens. Give, you get. I don't know. You, we feel better, right? So try and find something that you can do that they can be engaged in. It could be the 1,500 lira SMS, 1,500 lira that the ministry is doing. Let them type it. I support with 1,500 lira this uh, corona and, and then send it. It's good. Uh, you can do some gratefulness exercises at the end of the day, either as a family or help your kid just re re remind themselves of what was, what was good during the day, what worked, um, what did they feel they contributed to. And at the end of every day, they just do a one-minute checklist and sleep 
uh, you know, sleep better. Don't forget to look after yourself as a parent because that's going to impact your teen, right? We want to, we are here to last long with our teen. This is a marathon. This is not a hundred meter sprint. So take good care of yourself. Ask for breaks. Ask your partners to take, uh, to take over. Ask some neighbors to pitch in, some cousins to pitch in if they are practicing safe behaviors. Um, it's okay if every an hour or so you take a 15 minute for you, what I like to call mini vacations. They are more effective than once a year vacation. Take daily mini vacations for you and for your teens. Let them know that you know they can take this 10 minutes out of work or out of studying and it's super important. And the last thing I want to end with, this is a very simple thing from a Harvard colleague who came up with it because we're using screens a lot. It's the 2020-20 rule. It's interesting that it's in the 2020 year. But basically, every 20 minutes, look far ahead, at least 20 meters ahead, for 20 seconds. It's just to rest your eye, rest your brain, and then go back to the screen. So do that, and then go back to the screen. It's very helpful. It's like a stretching. And I know this can sound silly or simple, maybe, but believe me, it is effective. Thank you very much. I'm here to answer some of your questions, and these are just some websites that you can use. So I'm just going to keep the screen up for your question. Uh, Michael, mm -hmm. it's me again. Right. So I'm going to ask you uh, something that um, uh, parents ask us as counselors. Yeah. What's what's the is there a, coll a correlation between self harm and suicide? It's a big, I know it's yeah, uh, there is. end office. No, no, there is. Uh, the, there is a correlation, either a direct correlation or through a diagnosis. So the most common one is that people who self-harm might have a personality disorder or are on, a, on the spectrum of a personality disorder. Yes. The most common one is borderline personality disorder. And incidentally, the research shows that around 60% of youth who are diagnosed with depression have BPD, or borderline personality disorder. And borderline personality disorder is a significant personality. It's one of the toughest personality disorders, but now we have more effective treatments for it, um, which is about, you know, uh, emotional uh, intensity, liability, fear of abandonment, and self-harm, and poor uh, as body image. Um, and uh, these are high, at high risk people, individuals who have personality disorder, the BPD specifically at higher risk for self-harm and for suicidality. So this is one common mechanism. The other one is seeking, you know, learning uh, um, the victimization or uh, learned helplessness and, it, and it's linked to uh, um, a cry for help. So it's a language, right, to, to ask for help by self-harming. And sometimes a lot of people don't want to commit suicide, but they want to get somebody's attention. Sometimes, unfortunately, what they do ends up killing them. Um, but so, yes, that's why any self-harm behavior is in a way considered a suicidal attempt because it is one step before suicidal attempt, and we want to intervene again, people. Again, if you had done this interview with me or 15 years ago, I wouldn't have said this. I would have preached more empathy and love. Now, in addition to the empathy and love, I'm adding um, more solid mm -hmm. intervention, right? Reaching out to people, talking to your team, communicating, educating yourself, seeking help of counselors, uh, asking somebody in the family who is a mental health specialist, talk to them, seek, seek therapy. Sometimes you have to take medication. Uh, and you remember a few years ago, uh, I mean, um, the series 13 Reasons Why? I'm sure you heard of it, where mm -hmm. the teen commits suicide at the end because she was bullied. And, and there was an increased number of suicide, suicide attempts in the world. I mean, this is... Yeah. I, so, yeah. why do, how can you explain this? There is, is always... Just watching the show? Is it just yeah. Been? There is a factor, and the research has shown a bit of correlation with that. So, the normalization and the kind of sometimes the either neutral or sometimes even positive media portrayal like of the glorification of it. Thank you. 
that is one factor but again it is not causative so it is like an airplane crash this is another metaphor that has been useful for me all the studies of airplane crashes when they take the black box right and then they study them they realize it's not one thing this is an addition of risky behaviors or unchecked behaviors or unseen behaviors that culminates in the crash that is why early intervention is super important and it starts it starts with the psychosocial changes so when your young child uh, you know uh, fights with a five a fellow five year old over a toy this is a golden opportunity to teach effective emotional management communication skills healing skills trying to um, work out the relationship between the children and the parents together at, at, at an early age. This is really helpful. Uh, peer isolation, you know, asking your peer, what happened? Why are you not talking to Tina anymore? Tell me more. Yeah, that makes sense. She really hurt you uh, when she, you know, in a way she backstabbed you. I get that. Let's see what we can do about that. Yeah. Have you tried talking to her? Um, okay. What did you say? What did she say? How did you feel? All right. Any other option? Uh, what did your friend Karim tell you about her? Okay. Is he talking to her? Okay. What can you do? So following up would be super important because it's going to keep your kid socially engaged. It's going to teach him that, yes, people do backstab us. People do hurt us. Yet we, we don't need to feel victim, uh, you know, victimized. Or, you know, we can do something. Bullying, a big one. Speak to the counselor. Work out, you know, is there a bullying campaign or a bullying, uh, you know, uh, law at the school? How effective is it? How can you contribute to it as a parent, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. You, you know, if your child has worked that out, they're more resilient. How they, how can they become agents of change in bullying? Maybe sharing their story, maybe writing an article, maybe anonymous one at the beginning, etc. This kind of community, community engagement can go a long way for everybody. Mm. Yeah. The other thing I need to warn of is oh. if, you're, if you have a teen or an adolescent, please keep the medication as a last resort. These medications were made for adults. There is only one, which is I think Favarin, that is uh, evidence-based for uh, young adults, but the rest are not, we don't have enough evidence base for them. So we use them as a last resort. If you go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, you sense that they are too quick to give medication. Please talk to them about it and tell them that you're not comfortable with this right now. And if, if they're useful to you, stay with them. If you don't feel comfortable with a mental health professional, please change. I'm going to give you a quick tip. So the first one or two sessions are enough to make you feel comfortable or not. If you're not comfortable, that's okay. It doesn't have to be your fault. It doesn't have to be the therapist's fault. It's your right to change therapist. Even if you've heard the best stories about the therapist, there's a chemistry, there's a click. If, if it's negative, it doesn't work. The second tip I want to tell you, if you do work with a therapist, either you as parents or your teenagers, after eight sessions maximum, you didn't feel an improvement. There was no improvement. You need to change therapist also. And you can discuss it with your therapist if he or she is open-minded enough. You can talk about it and they can give you a good referral. So these are just quick tools for you as a client, as somebody who's receiving the service, to know when to change and when not to change. All right? So remember, first one or two sessions are enough to make you feel comfortable to try out a therapist. And then eight sessions. If within this eight sessions, you're not getting benefit, change. If within these eight sessions, you or your child is getting worse, change. And this is normal. This is nobody's fault. It's normal. It happens. Uh, Michael, they're asking if you can put the links again on the screen. Okay. And if, they, if, they, if someone wants your contact details. Right. So maybe I can send you, uh, Donna, the PowerPoint over email. And sure. my contact, is, is there an email list? Um, but quickly, I'm going to give you my clinic cell phone number. Uh, for those of you who want to write it down right now, it's 03 509 860. 03 509 860. 
you can contact me over WhatsApp and I'll get back to you within 24 hours. And if you want the slides, uh, please contact uh, Donna and I'll, I'll email it to her. Uh, I'd love to share. Yeah, Mr. Knox will share it with, uh, with all the... Uh, oh, perfect. Yes. Good perfect. Yeah. So, do we yeah. have any more questions, maybe from parents? I'm going to no. stop sharing screen so I see people's faces. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So only us. <laughs> I think that's it. If, any, if anyone else has questions, they can always ask us or Dr. Michael. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really interesting. It was really, we learned a lot. Yes. And if you read on the chat, everyone is. Uh, Thank you, Mom. Thank happy. you, Mona. It was such a pleasure, and I love the questions, and I hope I was useful, and I'm ready to help in any other way I can. Thank you. Thank you, Thank I see people. You're welcome. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.